Good morning, I'm Amy Lensing-Tate with the UWM Alumni Association. Thank you for joining us for this week's mobile master chat. We're thrilled to have you join us each week live as we bring UWM faculty to your home office. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Sandra McClellan from UWM School of Freshwater Sciences. She's a proud alum of UWM's Clinical Laboratory Sciences program and worked at Miller Brewing Company before attending graduate school at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Her work focuses on understanding the linkages between the environment and human health, particularly in urban coast systems. Her lab uses microbiome signatures from animals and humans to identify pollution sources in water and had developed approaches to investigate contamination in stormwater, outfalls, rivers, and the causes of beach closings. More recently, Dr. McClellan is analyzing wastewater samples to understand the trends of COVID-19 in Wisconsin communities and is partnering with researchers nationwide to implement surveillance programs that will provide data for a more informed public health response. She's published more than 60 scientific papers and has given numerous national and international talks on her work. So with that, I hand things over to Dr. McClellan. Thanks, Amy, for that introduction. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about our work to monitor for SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes the COVID-19 disease in wastewater. And at the end of the talk, I'm gonna mention how we're trying to implement a real-time surveillance network throughout Wisconsin. And Abby, if you could just check to see if I have control of the slides, there we go. Um, so as Amy inter introduced, I actually am a proud alum of UWM and my background in clinical lab sciences really has given me this really great foundation for doing laboratory testing and doing it with good precision, good quality control. And then my background at Miller Brewing Company gave me a perspective of sampling whole systems. Um, being from Milwaukee, many of you may be familiar with the brewing process. It's complex and there's a lot of microbes actually involved in it. So my time there gave me some really great background on how to sample a system. And then when I went on to earn my PhD, um, there's a lot of areas in environmental toxicology, but what I was most interested in is how microorganisms can really help us reduce toxins or be used as tracers in the environment. So the project I'm gonna talk about today, um, as I look back, I find myself almost perfectly trained to take on this kind of work. So after I finished my um, PhD, I came back to Wisconsin and to be honest, I came back to Wisconsin to um, come to UWM and do some teaching in microbiology, maybe a little bit of research, but I really wanted to live by the lake. I wasn't necessarily working on the lake at that time, but within a year or two of being here, um, my research went from looking at microbes in soil to trying to understand water pollution. And a big part of that work was developing new indicators so we could tell if fecal pollution that we found in the water was from animals such as, you know, stormwater runoff, pet waste or agriculture runoff, or if it was a sewage concern, which would be from people. And in cases we have broken sewer lines or maybe combined sewer overflows. Um, and we have a lot of kind of unrecognized infrastructure problems in our, in our city. So when we'd look in the waterways, we'd see hey, we can't figure this out. We just see E. coli, a common bacteria in the water um, that tells us there's fecal pollution there. So my lab set out to do a lot of sequencing of these sources to find all the organisms that were in sewage and agricultural waste and stormwater runoff. And a big part of it was finding new indicators. Um, so we could track pollution concerns in the environment. But along the way, we also wanted to understand the health risks. So we would look for the different viruses that were present in sewage that could make us sick. And those would tell us, you know, is there really a health risk there? So the question I always get is why not just look for the viruses directly in water? Well, that's almost impossible because these, these 
techniques are really picky and hard to implement for testing for the viruses. So it was easier to look at the sewage samples itself to see what was in the sewage samples. And then we could kind of extrapolate if we find sewage in water, we would be able to tell what kind of health risk is there. So I want to take a moment to just mention one of the um, most noted microbiologists of, I, I would say of all time, from the mid 1800s to maybe the late 1800s, Louis Pasteur made some great discoveries that really advanced microbiology and science in general. Um, for, um, he kind of discovered the principles of fermentation, pasteurization, he saved the silkworms and hence the silk industry in France um, by understanding how the silkworms in nurseries were getting a microbial infection and dying. And he was able to find kind of clean bedding and clean spaces for them and hence healthy silkworms. And he also was responsible for some of the earliest vaccinations, um, both, ra both rabies and anthrax. So one of my favorite quotes from Louis Pasteur is chance favors a prepared mind. And that's how I felt and many of my colleagues felt around the country that worked on these environmental issues and were trying to understand kind of what was in sewage, what viruses were present. Um, when the pandemic hit, we all kind of felt like, hey, we can apply that knowledge to this really new problem. So the, um, many of you are kind of familiar with how this pandemic has evolved and many of you probably, um, it hit your radar screen at different times. For me, it really caught my attention about mid-January to late January when I started seeing headlines about this virus that was um, you know, responsible for 25 deaths and had infected 800, um, 800 different people. We get viruses all the time. So why did this virus kind of get on my radar screen? It was because it was a virus that had not been found in people before. And that's really important because that means we don't know what kind of health effect it's going to have. So why is it important if we have not kind of had a virus before and it's a new emerging virus in people? Viruses are very host specific. So animal viruses, um, animal viruses essentially are within animals. They get passed within the same animal species, but they don't affect other animals or people. And the same with human viruses. And that's because the virus needs something very specific to get into the host cell. And that would be a receptor on kind of the outside of the cell. So when we say viruses are host specific, it's because it needs something to get into the host cell. Well, in the case of the coronavirus, this virus was now able to recognize something on the host cell and get in and replicate and essentially cause disease. So with viruses being host specific, it means that in general, um, viruses that humans have go human to human, viruses that animals have go animal to animal, but um, we become immune over time because we've seen the same viruses. When a virus kind of jumps species, an animal virus now can recognize a human receptor, um, it suddenly is something that our bodies have no immunity to and hasn't seen before. So we can get some really severe kind of health effects from that. Um, or our immune system can fight it off. And that's what we're finding with this um, novel coronavirus. There's many other examples of how viruses have jumped species. Um, influenza is a good example of that. The, the swine flu, another influenza that have come from um, swine. Um, both of those are examples of viruses that were in kind of livestock that went to humans. And then there has been another SARS virus, which stands for um, sudden acute respiratory syndrome. There was one in 2011 and it jumped from um, bats into the human population. And that's true with the current SARS virus. Um, this virus went from bats into kind of an intermediate animal and then eventually, um, eventually humans. Once a virus has kind of mutated and has gone from an animal and it can recognize a human, 
um, it now can recognize any human cell. So the first person that gets infected can easily start handing it off to other humans. And that's when you get the human to human transmission. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus was thought to originate at the Wuhan, the Wuhan wet market. And this is a, a wet market is where they have live animals. And the original speculation was that it was from an animal at the wet market, but the epidemiology really doesn't support that. It's much more a site of kind of a super spread. It's a very crowded area. So there was somebody who probably got the original virus. Um, and then from that point, was um, you know in this crowded market and was able to pass it to many people. So while it went probably from a bat to an intermediate species, um, it probably went to a human and that human went to the wet market. And we're all probably really familiar with how this has kind of evolved over the last four, five, six months. There's been more than um, 100,000 new cases reported worldwide as of May 31st. Um, and sadly, more than 375,000 deaths. And that number is probably underestimated because early on, people who were passing away due to respiratory illness, um, it was probably thought to be the flu or other issues. And now we're finding out it, it maybe was the coronavirus. So this leads me into what I wanna talk about, um, how, we, how we can kind of get in handle on the dynamics of this pandemic by using sewage surveillance. Early on and still kind of currently, um, we are testing people who have symptoms. So we're really aware of kind of the prevalence within the small group of people that have been tested. But it doesn't help us understand what's going on um, more so in the community. Are there just a few other people that don't have symptoms that um, haven't been tested? Or is it, um, you know, is it a case where there's um, asymptomatic carriers? So it could be either situation. It could be that what we're testing represents pretty much all people, or we're only so seeing kind of a small um, a small slice of the story. So this is where sewage surveillance can have some usefulness. When we expand testing, we kind of lose our, um, we lose kind of our, our point of reference. Early on, we're testing most people that have symptoms. As testing becomes more available, we're testing more people, including asymptomatic people. So it's hard to understand if, um, you know, if, the infection rate is going up or down because we're kind of changing our criteria. We're changing the rules of how we judge that. So it's essentially a moving target. And this is where sewage surveillance can really come in um, as something useful. These are some stats that I took from a um, journal Sentinel um, article. And you can see that as we track new confirmed cases, they kind of go up and down daily, but there's a trend. And we wanna understand this trend sooner than what we're seeing um, in terms of the health effects like hospitalizations or deaths. If we can understand the trend even a week or two earlier, we can maybe take some proactive actions. So this comes back to what I started this talk about, um, what my research is. So we, um, for almost 15 years now, have taken sewage samples and we've sequenced all the community, the microbial community in there. We've developed new indicators, but we've learned a lot about um, how a sewage sample from a city represents a human population. So this is the service area for um, kind of the Milwaukee metropolitan area. And this graphic is from the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. There are more than 6,000 miles of pipes in our city, laterals to homes and um, municipal pipes, and then some main pipes that MMSD um, actually owns. And they all channel to two wastewater treatment plants. So if you wanna get a sample of a million people um, in duplicate, this is a great system to, to sample. 
There were some early reports out of the Netherlands that um, told us it was really feasible to detect this coronavirus, which is a respiratory virus um, in, in sewage. Um, and then there were also reports out of Australia from one of my collaborators um, who used it throughout Australia and especially in Brisbane and uh, Melbourne and some other cities that again told us it was feasible to detect this respiratory virus in sewage. And then there was another recent report that came out that showed actually tracking the viral signal in sewage kind of mirrored new cases of COVID. And like I said, we want to get an earlier warning of kind of cases going up or down than earlier than what our health indices would tell us. You know, we don't wanna wait until we see an increase in hospitalizations or deaths. We wanna know maybe a week or two ahead of time of what's happening in the community. So um, our kind of goal of the surveillance program is to follow trends. Are we seeing more viral RNA in sewage? Are we seeing reductions in sewage? And this would mean that our public health actions are working. And can we use detection as an early warning in small towns where there's no reports? Um, so while we can monitor Milwaukee and we're fairly certain and we do see the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus in sewage, um, what about some of these smaller towns where there aren't many reports? Can we monitor to, to make sure it's not spreading there? So a little bit about how we actually test this, because I said testing for viruses is really complicated. And one of the first things is after we collect our sewage sample, and this is, um, we don't physically collect it, the wastewater treatment plant collects it. Um, when we get it, we first concentrate all the microbes that are in there, the bacteria, the viruses, and we do that by precipitating them down. And then we extract the genetic material, um, and in this case, the RNA. So there's two kinds of genetic material in a cell, RNA and DNA. And this virus happens to be an RNA virus. So we're going after that, that piece of it. Um, and then we actually have to copy it to make DNA because that's how we can actually amplify, target and detect it. So we copy it and then we um, add reagents and then we can actually detect the DNA. From essentially the point of extracting the RNA all the way to detecting it is exactly like how clinical samples are analyzed. We're doing almost the exact same process. It's this front end part of getting sewage samples, getting the right kind of sample that represents the community um, and concentrating it that is where we have some um, kind of specialty techniques that we use that are kind of specific to the environmental community. And then this is some example data. You know, city one might be where it's just very low levels and it stays low levels. City two might be not doing so good with their social distancing. Maybe they're having um, some super spreader events and they have some increases. And then city three, um, is an example of where, you know, we may, we might see some daily changes, but they maybe aren't significant because of the kind of day-to-day -day variability that we expect. Again, I want to highlight this as example data only. Um, we've just started some of our testing, but this is kind of what we expect to see. I get this question a lot. Can sewage surveillance replace testing? Do we really have to test all these people? And the answer is no, we cannot replace kind of person, personal testing with sewage surveillance. And the biggest reason is because to control this virus, we need to do contract tracing. We need to understand who is positive and then have them self-isolate and then find the people that they've had contact with and either test them and make sure they're um, not infected, or if they're infected, have them isolate, or if it's unknown, they should self-isolate. So the contact tracing and this testing is really how um, we're going to control kind of mini outbreaks that we see happening. And then the other question I get a lot is, can we really understand how many people are, are you know, infected? And the answer to that is no, we can't come up with an absolute number we can follow a trend and we can compare it to other data, 
But when we kind of try and do the math, the big problem is we don't really know the shedding rate. So I'm working on algebra with my um, sixth grader these days, and it's called a variable. What is X? Well, the shedding rate X in our equation to figure it out is a big unknown. And um, it could be anywhere from 10 to the fifth to 10 to the 11th viral particles per mil of sewage. Um, and that's because a single tissue that you blow your nose in and you flush down the toilet can have 10 to the 11th viral particles. Or if it's just a person shedding, it could have 10 to the fifth viral particles. That's a million fold guess on our variable. Um, so we, we make this point a lot that we, we aren't going to be able to say how many people are sick, but we can definitely follow whether it's going up or down in time. Um, so just to kind of wrap up and summarize, as we're kicking off this surveillance program, um, I, wanna, I wanna maybe give you a few details on that. Um, first of all, we're collaborating with 10, probably 10 research labs nationally. So University of North Carolina, North Carolina State, um, uh, Stanford, Notre Dame. There's a whole group of us that do this work um, in the environment. And over the last couple of months, we've come together to kind of share methods and try and figure out the best, best way to detect it because we're all implementing some kind of sewage surveillance in our own communities. Um, and then we've been archiving wastewater samples since, Mar since March. So this week and next week, we're kicking off the actual analysis. And then we're gonna be able to go back retrospectively and say, hey, what was happening? Um, unfortunately, we don't have samples before mid-March. It took a while to get all the biosafety in place, um, but we will have a pretty good record of how our kind of stay-at-home order was able to drop um, the prevalence rate in the community. Um, and then most importantly, um, you know, we're doing this effort in Racine and Milwaukee and Green Bay, which are some of the more populated areas, but we're part of a statewide effort with the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene at UW-Madison. And they put in a large um, grant, which I'm a collaborator on, which is funded by the Department of Health Services. And through this project, they're gonna be able to do surveillance in all 72 counties. So my lab is responsible for kind of the, the high population areas that we're gonna test more frequently. And they're also going to be able to go out throughout the state and implement this surveillance program. And again, this was um, just recently funded. As a matter of fact, yesterday I got the notice um, of award. So we're kicking it off over the next couple of weeks, but we're in it for the long haul. This is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And we really think that over you know, the next year, um, we're going to have to monitor this closely to make sure it doesn't get out of control. And then also on the positive side to understand when things are working well. Okay, so what can we do with the data? Um, we want to compare to local hospital records, again, for a predictive index. Can we act more quickly when we see trends change? And then as an early warning in areas where maybe they don't have coronavirus present, um, and then we can also compare to other states because we're working with these 10 labs nationally, um, we can look at how, how trends are moving in their state compared to how trends are moving in Wisconsin. And the real key to this is communication. And I can't say that enough. As scientists, we can generate this data, but as we hand it off, we need to be able to explain what does it mean? You know, what can we get out of the data? What can we not get out of the data? How does it need to be interpreted? And we're forming an experts panel to, to help do this um, that includes several people from Wisconsin. And we have a pending um, application to the Alfred P. Sloan um, Foundation. And they're really supportive of doing this type of science communication. So I'd like to wrap up and just thanks the people that are actually um, doing a lot of the hands-on work. Shushan Fang, my postdoc, is the real technical person. Um, Jill McClary is this great postdoc who understands wastewater systems. And then Deb Dila um, really anchors all the organizational part. Um, and then my collaborators, Ryan Newton, who is another professor at the School of Freshwater Sciences, and Angela Schmolt, who runs the Genomics Center. 
her technical expertise has been so invaluable. And then I'd like to just put a shout out to all my collaborators at the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene at UW-Madison. Um, and they're really anchoring the bulk of the Wisconsin work. So I want to turn it back over to um, Amy and see if there's any questions. And I believe they will pose a few questions. Um, I know some of you probably have been submitting them via chat. Okay, and I do have um, I do have the first question. Is it easy to is is it an easy test to perform? Um, and the answer is no. It almost takes three whole days to process the sample, extract the DNA, um, and then work with the genetic material through these different steps. And while we can test the sample um, and get a result. Along with that whole process, we have to do so many different controls to make sure each step worked. So for each answer we get, there's probably about six other tests that have been performed just to say everything's working perfectly. And those numbers usually won't even be seen, but they're part of our laboratory protocols. Okay, and I did hit on this already. Can you tell how many people are sick in the community? Um, so from the sewage surveillance data itself, um, the, the answer is no. We, we just don't know that variable, that, that X variable. However, um, as we do more kind of testing or more random testing, if we partnered with the health departments that are collecting testing and they randomly chose, you know, 10% of the population to test um, and we got that number, now we know how many people are positive in the community and we can relate that to the sewage numbers that we're seeing. So maybe through connecting it through actual testing data, again, not the bias, let's only test the six people, but the random testing, we may be able to glean some information from that number and then follow it in the future. Oh, this is a great question. Are you able to give advice about swimming at beaches along Lake Michigan in um, during times of COVID-19? So this is a so um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a respiratory virus. Um, so it's rather wimpy in the environment. Some of the enteric viruses um, can last in wastewater and and last in sewage, but um, a respiratory vi virus really wants to go person to person. So you are more likely to get it at the beach because somebody next to you, um, somebody you know, sitting closer than six feet or maybe standing in line for concessions has it, or maybe you touch a surface rather than the water. It's very unlikely that it would survive in water um, and be infectious. And we are not um, actually recommending that people test contaminated water for the virus directly. We actually recommend just testing for some of the sewage indicators if you wanna know if sewage is there. Um, so definitely person to person is by far the most likely way to um, contract the virus. And then um, the next question is, how do you see the infection impacting your lab's research long-term? That is, you know, that's another great question because I think in January, um, you know, I was almost watching this train wreck happen. And by the end of January, we were kind of shifting gears. And I think one of, one of the things that will come out of this is understanding how doing sewage surveillance of a population can give us um, much more information than just, you know, some of the health metrics. So while we're applying it to this particular pandemic, it's gonna make us more prepared for the next emerging virus. And then it also may you know, help us see new ways that we can survey for health in the community. We've done some work to try and look at you know, indicators of diabetes and different kind of health effects that you can see in the microbiome of people. Um, and that's been, you know, that's very exploratory work, but I can, I can certainly see our lab moving a little bit more in that direction because of this experience. 
And then how long do you expect it to take to see trends in the Milwaukee communities? Um, as I said, we're just starting up testing and we can get we can get data now, but the hard part is doing all of the controls and making sure that data says what we think it says. So I would say over the next month, we definitely want to follow all the data before we're actually reporting it. And, and that's just being really prudent, again, about understanding how all the controls work. I think trends would change over a weekly or a monthly basis and not necessarily a day-to-day -day basis. I showed that in our example data. So I would say over maybe a two or three week time, we can look back on the past two or three weeks and ask, are we doing better or worse? And I think that was the final question. And thanks so much to everybody that tuned in today. I really enjoyed giving this talk and I'm excited about being able to contribute to doing some surveillance for this during this pandemic. Thank you, Sandra. UWM and the Milwaukee community are certainly lucky to have you, um, you working on this issues and all the other issues you've worked on in our community previously. So everybody, please, Join us again this time next week when we'll be featuring Jeff Termal. He's the Director of Business Engagement and an adjunct lecturer for the EMBA program at the Lubar School of Business. And he'll be sharing some insights um, about the pandemic's effect on supply chain, or supply chain, sorry, what challenges lie ahead and what the leading companies are doing to build and improve their competitiveness. Um, the week after that, we'll feature Margaret Noonan talking about Native American studies. And we hope to have you join us then. Thanks again, Dr. McCullen. Thanks.